taught you to hate the color of your skin? Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate? You should ask yourself, who taught you to hate being what God gave you? Most of us blacks, or Negroes as he called us, really thought we were free without being aware that in our subconscious, all those chains we thought had been struck off were still there. And there were many ways where what really motivated us, motivated us was our desire to be loved by the white man. Malcolm meant to lance that sense of inferiority. He knew it would be painful. He knew that people could kill you because of it, but he dared to take that risk. He was saying something over and above that of any other leader of that day. While the other leaders were begging for entry into the house of their oppressor, he was telling you, build your own house. Welcome to the Gilchrist Experiment. Uh, that goes back to our early beginnings uh, that Malcolm did. It's funny, it's very nostalgic <laughs> watching that old stuff. Our old ways, how we uh, settled for just going along with the rules and taking what we had as a, some progress. Uh, Malcolm put it to. Put it Better stand up on our hind legs? Hind legs? I don't think so. <laughs> stand tall and speak like a man. All right. Welcome to the show, Graham. Okay. Hey, good to see you. Good to be back. All right. Last week we had a few conflicts, but we resolved it in the end. No. No. All right. We have a little technical difficulty with the mic. Mic on? Can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. We just tested this. Can you hear me? We all right? Talk to me. Yeah, we can hear you, but it's not great. All right, let's go to the next roll, and we'll yeah. try and fix it in between. Okay. The next Roland will be on what? Malcolm and Martin. Malcolm and Martin. And we're waiting, waiting for... Uh, Dr. Jeffries. Dr. Yeah. Jeffries. Yeah. I bet we'll do the Roland on Malcolm and Martin. The white man pays Reverend Martin Luther King, subsidizes Reverend Martin Luther King, so that Reverend Martin Luther King can continue to teach the Negroes to be defenseless. That's what you mean by nonviolent. Be defenseless. Be defenseless in the face of one of the most cruel uh, beasts that has ever taken the people into captivity. That's this American white man. And they have proved it throughout the country by the police dogs and the police clubs. A uh, hundred years ago, they used to put on a white sheet and use a bloodhound against Negroes. Today, they have taken off the white sheet and put on police uniforms they uh, traded in the bloodhounds for police dogs, and they're still doing the same thing. And just as Uncle Tom, back during slavery, used to keep the Negroes from resisting the bloodhound or resisting the Ku Klux Klan by teaching them to, to love their enemy or pray for those who use them despitefully, today uh, Martin Luther King is just a 20th century or modern Uncle Tom or a religious Uncle Tom who is doing the same thing today to keep Negroes defenseless in the face of attack that Uncle Tom did on the plantation to keep those Negroes defenseless in the, in the face of the attack of the Klan in that Well, I, I don't think of uh, love as, uh, in this context, as emotional bosh. I don't think of it as uh, a weak force. 
But I, I think of love as something strong and that uh, organizes itself into powerful uh, direct action. Now, this is what I try to teach in the struggle in the South, that uh, we are not engaged uh, in a struggle that means we sit down and do nothing. Uh, that there's a great deal of difference between non-resistance to evil and non-violent resistance. Uh, non-resistance leaves, uh, leaves you in a state of stagnant passivity and deadman complacency, wherein non-violent resistance means that you resist in a very strong and determined manner. And I think some of the uh, criticism of uh, nonviolence, or some of the critics, fail to realize uh, that we are talking about something very strong, and they confuse non-resistance with nonviolence. The goal of uh, those of you too young to understand what was going on in the early '60s, we're talking about the conflict between uh, Martin and Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm, of course, was very militant and not willing to sit at a lunch counter and get beat up. <laughs> a lot of us were like that. I mean, I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't understand how anybody could do that. But Martin prevailed with his religious beliefs of, I suppose, turn the other cheek. I mean, uh, I don't know, know too many black men that could do that. But the Christian belief or uh, believing that love can conquer all. Well, the what principle think, of Graham? turning the other cheek was not passivity. People misunderstand that, mm. that phrase. When a slave was struck, he normally complied. Mm -hmm. Turning the other cheek, and it goes back to the Roman era. It's not, mm -hmm. not American slavery, back to the Roman era. When, when uh, Jesus spoke about it, the slave is struck. And the slave stands there in defiance and says, I'm still not going to do what you want me to do. Mm -hmm. You can hit me again. I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. That person in their mind has already freed themselves. It's like the elephant, the baby elephant that is chained to a stake. Mm -hmm. And as that elephant grows, and he might be six tons in weight, he believes that that chain can hold him. Mm -hmm. And he will not resist. As soon as the chain gets taut, the elephant rocks back in place. When the person says, you hit me, hit me again. It's not going to get you to do, mm -hmm. get me to do what you want me to do. And therein is the lesson in turning of the other cheek. It's not, the person is, not that the person is saying, oh, you can just beat me up. No matter what you do, I'm not going to do what you want me to do. I have mm -hmm. freed myself mentally and ultimately, physiologically, my great-great-grandfather was on a plantation in uh, 1854. In South Carolina, they brought him to a plantation somewhere. And a white man said, well, I'm your master. My great-great-grandfather wasn't having it. So rather than get into a conflict, he buried the hatchet in his head mm -hmm. and left the plantation. So. It's in your mind and in your will as to what you're willing to accept and what you're not going to accept. Well, most black people don't have that nerve to stand up and fight against uh, the slave master the way your great but, but grandfather did. But there were did. many. There were many but, that we're, did, we're but they don't, they don't record it and they don't talk but, about it. But what I'm saying is that during the struggle between Martin and Malcolm, mm -hmm. everybody was trying to play by the rules. Thinking America, if you worked hard and, and did your diligence about getting an education and doing everything the right way, not being a gangster as it seems to be prevalent today amongst our people. Uh, that's the only way to make it, seems like today. In comparison to the days, we had, Malcolm had cleaned up his act. He was no longer a hustler. Right. He no longer drank and fornicated and... He kept himself clean. He was doing it the right way. Martin was doing it a different way. And yet the two were striving towards the same center, right. is to get equality for the black man. And the reason why I show this comparison 
between Malcolm and Martin is to try to bring it up date today and how we're, we had a little misunderstanding last week about how we as blacks deal with the situation of Trump, <laughs> you know, and his nonsense, where we're all trying to do the right thing, living by the rules, by the Constitution. And we, we have this buffoon in the White House that's doing everything the wrong way and seems to be getting ahead. And everyone's seeing this and thinking America is as ill-equipped to, to, to fill out the Constitution of the United States and you get a, a president like this and you think that doing everything the wrong way is the right way to do it. If they're succeeding... Well, Martin said you've written us a... Yeah, right, written exactly. About check. Right. Just do what you said on paper. That's right. So now... The world can see, mm -hmm. and those living in this country who thought they were somewhere else right. can really see now that the colors, mm. covers have been pulled off, yeah, right. we're right. bare naked right. Right. before ourselves and before the world. Right. So the fraud and the scam of the United mm. States has been exposed, yep. and it has nothing to do... You think this is God's plan? Yeah. I think he is, I think he is exposing Why? this system for what it really that makes sense. is. That makes All right, sense. and my pastor was doing a series on systems last year. Mm -hmm. No system, no man-made system, is going to really be truly effective. Right. Because when you find something perfect, you have to avoid it. Because if you get involved in it, it becomes imperfect. All right. Mm. Now, <laughs> the the, Uni the United States. Back in the 60s, during the Vietnam War, you know, I, was, I had signed a contract uh, with the Army right. to serve as an officer. Now, a friend of mine wrote me from Nam and told me what they were doing in Nam, what was going on. And he said to me, don't find yourself here. Right. He said, we are treating them like the Nazis treated the Jews. Wow. So I had to make a decision because the, the, the truth was borne out. And this is what we have to understand. Once we are exposed to the truth, we have to make a decision. And truth is confrontational. Mm -hmm. Do you go along with it because people say you should go along with it? Or do you go against it because it is the right thing to do? And I had a decision to make. Mm -hmm. I went in and I told my lieutenant colonel, I'm not going to do this. Now, he was black, raised in Nebraska, dealt with the Klan growing up. Mm -hmm. We had a long conversation. He said, well, ultimately, it has to go, he was lieutenant colonel. It has to go to the colonel. I said, I'm just here to let you all know my decision. I don't need anybody's permission. I've made a decision. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I got a release. Six-year contract. And he, the colonel said to me, well, you sign your name. You got a contract. And my, re, my rebuttal to that is, you sign many contracts, which are called treaties with the indigenous people of this country. Mm. of which you've kept none. When the United States government goes back and fulfills every treaty that they've signed with the indigenous people of this country, then they can come back and talk to me about my signature on my contract to serve. Mm. I said, I will go to prison if I have to, but I will not serve. Wow. So I, I got a release. They gave me a 1A draft status, and I, I was never even called because I know the lieutenant colonel. I'm sure it wasn't because you brought up the past. <laughs> but you, this, that, you know, you, you've got to know, that's why it's important for us to study and to study history and just study. Because you never know when you're going to have to pull upon what you've learned to promote yourself, to defend yourself, mm. or protect somebody else. So when I threw that out there, what could he say? They said, well, we'll give you a release. I said, you're not giving me a release. I told you I am not going to serve. Mm. So... I never got called. I had a 1A draft status. I never got called. And I know it was because of the lieutenant colonel and whatever he did that I never got called. Well, but this is where we are now. The U.S. Congress... Some people today would call you a draft dodger. I wouldn't care what they call me. It doesn't make any difference to me. See, once you know the truth, mm. where do you stand? Are you going to go along just to get along? Or are you going to take a stance against what is evil? And we have been fed lie after lie after lie in this country to promote military agendas, to promote
business as usual to promote a military industrial con uh, complex, multiplicity of lies. Trump is just what this country is. Mm. He is well, what it I, is. I, I, I see Even the Congress, you look at the Congress. They're, I, you know, they're pussyfooting around. Oh, impeach, don't impeach. Oh, me. Graham, uh, uh. Uh, uh, that's not what this country is made of. I think there are more people on the side of righteousness than, than, than there are. I mean, they're just not showing up yet. I think some of these people that have really been you know, uh, brainwashed by Fox News, by the, by the president, by the, you know, making America white again. Uh, and this whole nostalgia for going back to the good old days and when unions were prevalent. But Trump is a con. Right. He's been found out as a con. And I think a lot of these people are waking up. It's just so difficult for them to accept that they're wrong. Which it, that's every people that has no no color right. on it. <laughs> right, that's every <everybody. laughs> that, truth everybody. is confrontational. If you you had your you know heart and soul sold on something, and then you find out this person isn't what you thought it was, mm. it's hard to sit back and say, "Damn, I made a mistake." And that's what's happened, I think, to a majority of these people that want to believe Trump, mm -hmm. want to believe that things are going to get better because he said it was. And he did a lot of good things, but they can't, they figure out, what about all the bad things he did and completely disrupted anything Obama accomplished? See, this is what I resent so much about Trump, is that we know him in here in New York. Uh, we just played last week. He called me up about the Central Park Five. I had a piece on it. We were going to play it, but um, I couldn't find it this morning. Um, but I'm just trying to say that I think there's a, I think there's a, a revelation coming to us with this Donald Trump business because I think we're going to, I think Joe Biden will come back and give us some civility again, some decency, which this country had for eight years. We learned to appreciate what Obama did. I mean, he looked so fabulous. And, and to listen to Trump talk about the failed administration, I mean, <laughs> the lies that... Right. I just, I'm just so amazed that this, like, the man's a psychotic. There's well, that's, no doubt you know, about it. Racism is, a, is an illness. That's it. That's it. And <laughs> it really is. It has been the bane of this country that's because it. we have not, it has not been dealt with. That's right. Even when Obama was president, well, it got worse. he couldn't talk about it. It got worse. Um, when the young man was shot in Florida, uh, Trayvon Martin. Trayvon. Now Obama we, said, that could have been my son. And people were incensed about that. Um, every little thing, and it, everything is predicated upon race, and there have been only a few broadcasters who have said, if Obama had done what Trump is doing, oh, God, God, as a black God, man, he'd have been, been run out of Washington God. in the first week. Yeah. So here you see the Congress sitting back. Now, um, Mueller announced today he's retiring. He's out. He's, leaving the, he he's leaving the Department of Justice. So he has nothing to say. He has nothing to say as an but official. But he read out what he put in the Mueller report. He gave a brief statement. I heard and it. he said he, he's not going to discuss this anymore. Keeping in Is mind, as an official, something different. as an official of the Department of Justice, but as a private citizen, he's gonna come that's another talk. story. Okay. He can be subpoenaed to come back. Okay. And if he has to, he'll read the whole 500 or whatever pages so. it is. You see, but the Congress has failed for eight years to do what they get paid to do. And that's to legislate, to govern, to oversee as a check and balance system in, in, under the preamble to the Constitution. They've been failing to do that. They're getting paid. They've paid themselves raises. Mm -hmm. But they're not overseeing. They've watched... Trump deplete financial uh, support to the EPA, to forestry, to national parks. They're trying to take away no. uh, the abortion issue. Everything that he can, he's depleting it. No. 
and people are suffering. They, there was a, a group of farmers they were interviewing in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Soybeans. China was the biggest purchaser they're of the soy there, crop. They have rotting. a soy crop rotting. He's destroying America. All right, and he's telling, he's and what they're America. doing, they don't want to talk about socialism, but they're engaging in socialism by now subsidizing the farmers and yeah, paying them off. Right. But he wants so it's a duplicitous method. Well, le let me bring on Dr. Jeffries by playing uh, what his uh, nephew was doing in Congress. My man from Brooklyn. Uh, Hakeem no. Jeffries. <laughs> Play that number three, and we'll bring on Dr. Leonard Jeffries. All right? You got, you got Doc ready to come on? Yeah. He went back out. Hakeem was at church on Sunday. Oh, you know, really? He, came, he spoke ah, every good. time he's in town. Good, he'll, good he'll brother. Come and spend a day with us. Good um, of innocent Americans. Nonsense. Three, this blanket assertion of executive privilege. Nonsense. Let's take all three. First of all, 17 different intelligence agencies have concluded that Russia interfered with our election, attacked our democracy for the sole purpose of artificially placing someone at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. They were successful. And that's also what the Mueller report shows. This is not a politically inspired witch hunt. I'm confused. Every single person at the helm of this investigation is a Republican. The person who initiated the investigation, former FBI Director James Comey, Republican. The FBI Director who replaced him and presided over the investigation, Christopher Wray, Republican. The person who decided to appoint a special counsel to preside over the investigation and then monitored it at the helm of the Department of Justice, the Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, Republican. The person who actually conducted the investigation, a war hero, a law enforcement professional, Bob Mueller, lifetime Republican. Who is the Attorney General going to investigate? The Republican Party? The notion that it's a politically inspired witch hunt is just one of 10,000 or more misrepresentations that have been spun out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's a shame that you choose to adopt it and parrot it. Second thing, re reputational interests? Really? Many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle actually perpetrated a witch hunt as it relates to securing more than 800,000 documents from this very same Department of Justice without regard to the reputational interests of Americans who have served this country. You weren't concerned with the reputational interests of Hillary Clinton. In fact, the top Republicans said that the sole objective was to undermine her, the former First Lady and Secretary of State. You weren't concerned with the reputational interests of Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. In fact, you embarrassed those two. They made mistakes, but you embarrassed those two. You weren't concerned with the reputational interest of Andy McCabe. So don't peddle that phony argument to us. This very same Department of Justice turned over 800,000 pages of documents, but they won't turn over a single page pursuant to a legitimately issued subpoena? And then you want to assert executive privilege. Are you kidding me? You can't assert executive privilege after the fact. When the closest advisors to the president have already spoken to Team Mueller, wait a second, let's try to go through this. White House counsel Don McCann talked to Mueller. There is no assertion of executive privilege. White House press secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders talked to Mueller. No assertion of executive privilege. White House communications director Hope Hicks talked to Mueller. There was no assertion of executive privilege. It's a phony argument. The House is a separate and co-equal branch of government. We're not a wholly owned subsidiary of the Trump administration. We don't work for Donald Trump. We work for the American 
people. We have a constitutional responsibility to serve as a check and balance on an out of control executive branch. The attorney general is totally out of control. He will be held in contempt of Congress. I yield back. What purpose is the general? Now, there you see a, a Jeffries, a King Jeffries, nephew to uh, Professor Leonard Jeffries, fighting for the cause of uh, black Americans. No, the United States. The United States of America. That's right. Right? You see, his political analysis is on, on, on the money. I mean, no doubt about it. What do you think, Doc? Proud of you? Well, it's not a matter of being proud. It's just... <clears throat> He's following in a deep tradition. Okay. And the tradition is to be prepared. And mm. when your moment arrives, take care of business. That's right. And he's done it. It's his younger brother, two years younger, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, has done it. He, re he wrote a book dealing with the struggle in the 60s, Bloody Lowndes, The Struggle for the Vote in Lowndes County. Brilliant book. So one went to the Southern School of Morehouse, got his education. He graduated at the top of the class. He had all A's except one B. That's his younger brother. Mm. And then Hakeem himself graduated summa cum laude at Binghamton. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to Georgetown, all A's to get his master's. And then he went on to NYU Law School. And he wasn't at the bottom, he wasn't at the middle. He was the graduation speaker at NYU Law School, and at that point, the dean of the law school, because Hakeem's desire was to go into politics, the dean of the law, the dean of the law school said, one day he will be our congressman. Mm -hmm. So his path has been laid out. Mm -hmm. Family has laid it out for him. His education has been a part of it. His working with the community, mm -hmm. his being educated and raised in a community. So when he talks about the church, he's not faking it. He grew up in Cornerstone Baptist Church. Okay. His nana, his grandmother, lived in back of the church, one block from the church. So his thing is very real, and he gets it honestly. His father, to be very frank, ran for political assembly in New York when he was a youngster. In other words, so even his father, who was a marshal, who was professor, master professor, Sensei Marlon Jeffries, his father was in the political arena before the son. Mm -hmm. And uh, he won the position. They acknowledged it, but they said, we, we had to steal it from you. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was yeah, because we were all fam family. Al Van and all of them were family but there's certain things that have to happen in the political arena. So we've accepted that. Even in my case, when we won the legal case, we put a city college case. People said, well, you look, no, you didn't win. Just to raise it and have a team of four lawyers, two men and two, two women, face the lawyers for the state of New York, the education department of New York, the city of New York, the city university of New York, a 30-day legal case in which these black legal minds and spirits beat back the New York City, the New York State, the Department of Education on their own turf. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying, and, and of course, Hakeem and Hassan, they understood what we were doing. Uh, in other words, what the struggle was all about. Okay. And so the thing is analysis, commitment, in fact, when he gave the graduation speech, he um, talked about the two to his class at NYU Law School. And just last week, he spoke at the graduation. Mm -hmm. He was the graduation speaker. Years before, he was the student speaker to the class. And his mission was to give them a pathway to go forth. And so he, he took the three C's. He gave his own someone called uh, Dr. J, Nana Kakujra Ajman II, has used the three C's as a core to the African value system. Communal, we live together. Right. Cooperative, we work together. 
and collective we share. That's the pyramid of the three C's. That's the mm -hmm. African value system. Of course, I also flip it and I have the three D's. I turn the pyramid upside down and you have domination, destruction, and death. That's the inherited European, American, or wherever the European is, that's his value system. Domination, destruction, and death. You can see the sweep of history. The Native Americans gone by the millions can tell you what domination, destruction, death. Africans pulled out of Africa by the millions can tell you what domination, destruction, and death. Europeans fighting Europeans can tell you what domination, destruction, and death, because they go from World War I, 100 million people killed the maim. World War II, 100 million people killed the maim. That's just in the 20th century. Right, right. But his message was the three C's, communal corporate, and he, he gave, he borrowed it from me, but he gave his own perspective on what it should be. And so uh, you, you, have to, you have to give credit to, to the families, but to the community, to the institutions, to the inspiration. He, they were involved in the Boy Scouts. That was a help. They were involved in, in the Little Leagues and all of that, sports. What kept you away from politics? No, I, I, I'm the ultimate politician. <laughs> <laughs> My whole thing is politician. But what kept me away from the local American politics, okay. I operate on an international scale. Okay. So I've had to operate all over Africa, okay. in the Caribbean, in Brazil, and also in America. So that uh, I, my vision was writ large. And uh, so uh, when people said, well, Dr. J, I wanted to be the mayor of my town as a seven-year-old. Mm. Where did the seven or eight-year-old get an idea that he's going to be a mayor of town. There were no black mayors. I was born in 1937. The f black political leaders, we had one, the priest in 28. And then later in the 40s, you had Dawson and Adam Clayton Powell. Mm -hmm. But you didn't get any black mayors until the 60s. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about trying to be a black mayor in the 50s as a kid. Well, not in the 50s, in the mm -hmm. 40s. You were li trying to live the American dream. No, but somebody put in my consciousness that you're going to be somebody. You can do and so that you somebody was the collective African community in Newark, New Jersey mm. that mm. we grew up in. Right. Newark was not Brick City. When we grew up, Newark, Newark was City. neighborhoods and communities. So the village that I grew up in, in the Roseville section of Newark, 14th Street where my brother and I and, and mother and father lived, 13th Street where my mother's family lived, 12th Street, where my father's family lived, that was an African community, a village. Don't, don't, of the 100 don't. kids I grew up with, 90 of us made it big. Well, that was a normal black community back in those that's days. That's right. Like, that was a normal we black of community. Yeah, 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 there was nothing us, different we, about we that. We controlled the socialization and acculturation. And if you control the socialization, which is your value system, who, who you were going to be. Right. That's right. done in the first five years of life. That's mm -hmm. what Francis Cress Wells and our great. Doc, let me interrupt you to give this to you. Well, it's your show, but yeah, I, I no, may not. I, I just want you to re relate right. to the younger people, the younger black people mm -hmm. that d didn't have the stability that we came up with at a time in black America. Well, that was a normal black family. Uh, we looked out and we gave our kids everything that was possible for us. We gave them, we gave them self-esteem. We said they can be anything they wanted That's to right. be. That's right. All right. But you, we take pride in talking about that because look how we come up mm -hmm. and how we think. And, but today, in the 21st century, with jobs lacking, you know, machinery has taken over, you know, mm -hmm. in the 21st century, right. computers have taken over a lot of the systems or things that we could do. Are, are transfers. There's different technology today. And I'm sure in that youth today, there's that same self-esteem, but they don't see the reflection like we saw it. I mean, they're not coming. They, they were bombarded by the genocide, the plague of the 80s. 
well, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But okay. Let's, let's be real. What we're talking about is the system of white supremacy. Amen. It didn't get born in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. It has been there for the last 500 years. I call it the Columbus era. 1492 okay. is Columbus supposedly discovering America. He didn't discover America. But have you seen the black family as disrupted as it is now? My point. But that's by design. Of course it's by design. So that we have to have but a But how do you explain that to the kids is by no, design? you have to sit down with them and have a relationship with your kids. But okay. we, we got caught up in having a relationship with ourselves and with the community. So in order to be somebody, you had to have things. You had to have a big car. You had to have a big house. You had to move out of that tight community where you were nourished to try to integrate. Integrate into what? Into the insanity of whiteness. Mm -hmm. And so we have victimized the, the generations that came after But My brother said, no, you take care of the world, Len Jeffries, big brother, Lenny, mm -hmm. little Lenny. He said, I'm going to take, I'm going to raise me. I'm going to live in, my, in Brooklyn, and I'm going to raise me some, some boys. And he did. That was a, a, a discussion that was had. And okay. I've been running around trying to take care of the world, and he made sure that they lived okay. in that community, nurtured, were nurtured in that community. That was a plan. Right. And, and, and so the two, his two boys have, have been successful. And Hakeem's two boys, one of them is this week, I believe, mm -hmm. are going to graduate from, to go on to college, and the other one has hit high school. And they have the same aspirations and whatnot because they were in, we didn't let the confusion of materialism infect us. Our people got infected with materialism. Big gold teeth, gold around, the, I'm wearing a, a symbol of the African spiritual power. I'm not wearing no gold chains. And if I wear gold chains, it would be from the Yoruba tradition, from the Akan. We were targeted to become materialistic in the unbelievable dimensions. Who, who needs uh, $500 of gold teeth in his mouth? Who needs earrings and all that? A Gucci bag for $500. Uh, and now expensive. you got long hair. You can buy it from Asia for, for $2,000. Materialism was infected in our community, but despiritualization was affected in our community. And also, our young men were sucked into the prison industrial complex, mm. that whole uh, school to prison or cradle to prison really, um, is real. It was planned. When you had the explosion of the 50s, the movement in the 50s, King represented that, then you had the movement of the students in 1960. I was in Europe when it was, I was so glad to see students mm. moving. And then it spread into the urban areas, urban rebellions, black power movements. This system said if these black folk keep moving like they are in the strategic positions that they are, this society is going to be turned upside right. Nixon, and I'm going to get right. the tape. We got to show this tape of Nixon and I believe Alderman mm -hmm. talking about <laughs> the, the, <coughs> the, the, the shipment of drugs into the black community. Oh, yeah. right. And that they knew what they were doing. Right. There was a detective in L.A. who spoke at Maxine Waters' um, hearings in California years yes. ago. I'm trying to remember his name. He has since died. It was a white detective. He said, the LAPD has been working with the CIA to bring drugs into the black communities. Oh, it right. is a program. That's the so 80s. We, we, right. We mm -hmm. need to understand mm -hmm. who we're dealing with. When the Klan came to march here in New York, about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, we had a rally in Foley Square. Mm -hmm. And I was speaking to the young people, and there were Bloods and Crips there. I said, you guys have been shooting and killing each other, and the Klan is laughing at you mm -hmm. because you're fulfilling their mission. That's right. it. You're getting rid of the rest of us. That's you it. need to understand who your enemy is. Right. That's right. I said, the people coming here, I said, my father and grandfather gunned these people down in Georgia in the 1930s. But you're shooting at your own brothers, mm -hmm. and they're laughing at you and thanking you. When the Klan showed up, the Bloods and the Crips tore into them.
and they mm -hmm. had to run. You know where they ran? They ran to police headquarters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They ran with their little sheets, Klansman. ran to police headquarters. <laughs> right. They had to take their stuff off, and they were escorted out of town. Mm -hmm. Integration mm -hmm. was one of the worst things that ever happened, in my opinion, to black people. Well, let's clarify it. Integration is necessary for people to be. You have to integrate your mind, body, and spirit. You have to integrate your family. But we had a misguided integration. We felt if we integrated with white folks, some magic would occur. First, you have to integrate with yourself. Mm -hmm. So you do not pull yourself apart. You going here, your sister going here, your auntie going there. That fabric of family. Right. All of our businesses co collapsed Perhaps, yes. under that Why notion that false sense their ice cream is better, their water is better, their air is but, better. But how about ourselves, how we deal with each other on, on all, all fronts? Let's be real about it. The most difficult people to get along with are family, people that you love the most and... Perhaps they go astray and you have to fight. Uh, but that's the fallout from this societal uh, construct. Uh, we, we have, if we, have we 70s, know what's happening. We're talking about 15 year olds. Now you've got generations from the time <laughs> that you were born well, to where these kids are is, now. They is, don't have right. the parental input. My point is they say that uh, who puts the guns in the community? Right. They ship them. Who in. puts the drugs in the community? We don't have. Who any. sells the drugs in the community? Who pulls the trigger? Just because you got a gun, that don't mean you have to shoot your brother. But if but you we don't are, have, we're if, easily if set off by minor things in life. When we be, we should. Do you realize the money that we could be making if we suddenly start importing the raw materials from Africa? Well, we have find some unity between right. African resources and American and black American industrial complex? Yeah, but you can't blame the victim. In other words, you can point to the difficulties in the family, etc. But we know... But you can't blame the this victim. This has been going on for 500 well, years. It. We haven't figured it out yet? Yes, we have. Your Hakeem was just letting you know. He was giving you his portion of the experience. I and his father gave our uh, portion of the experience. Our mothers and grandmothers and gave their portion. Black folk have realized what this system is all about, but we've always been seduced into trying to become white. We were never allowed to become black. An African, that's out of the question. See, I, I, that's mind control. The negative image of who you are, your roots. We were not allowed to have that. We fought. That's why we had the curriculum of inclusion. That's why we had black studies. That's why we had African studies. We're African people. When my, when my son was oh. in Iraq, he said the Iraqis, <coughs> excuse me, the Iraqis want, listen to this, American noses. They don't like broad noses anymore. They want, plastic surgery is big. When I was in Dubai and Abu Dhabi earlier this month, plastic surgery mm -hmm. is a big industry <laughs> because people want to look white. white. Right. It's not just black people affected by this. The rightness of whiteness. They have been corrupting and undermining mm -hmm. everybody across the globe. Look at um, the guy that ran the uh, Breitbart. Mm -hmm. um, that, that guy that looked like a, that hideous looking guy that was in the White House. Right. He Bannon, left. Steve Bannon. Bannon. He left and he went to Europe. He's been pushing that white right agenda yeah. in Europe. Mm -hmm. This is not something local. They have now decided that they have to regain control of this structure and of the globe, but they are the abject minority. Mm -hmm. Caucasians are the abject right. minority. We are not a minority. And they are doing everything wherever they can throughout Europe to launch a war against people of color across Europe and the United States to maintain control of financial structure, military, mm -hmm. the ecological systems, everything that can have Me a negative media. impact. Media. Everything. <coughs> It's an all-out assault on people of color. And now you've got people in the Middle East that want to have American noses. Right. Do, you, and in can Asia, we blame, can we blame to, it on to, Illuminati? A, can we discuss I, Illuminati? No, no. In other words, you're talking about lo, Illuminati is just a part of a total system of white domination. Yeah. And so we need to look at the totality. You can't just look at the top of it or look at the middle of it or look at the bottom of it and think you have an analysis. 
And analysis means you look at systems analysis, means you look at the total, you look at the economics, you look at the politics, you look at the culture, and you piece it together. They, in order to survive, they had to have an economics of exploitation because they, Europe is not a place where you have great mineral resources and whatnot. So they had to go out of Europe for that. Politically, mm -hmm. they don't have, from feudalism, a functional political system to unite. But since they broke feudalism, and 500 years ago, capitalism and slavery come together, they now have a system, economically, of dehumanizing people and stealing their wealth, and politically, of putting aside your personal conflicts, because the Europeans have a history of killing each other off, mm -hmm. But if they want to exploit other people, they have to find a unity formula. And so they created culture that we are the chosen of God. They have said that, and that's how they operate. The truth has exploded on the world. I think and we come to find God. out that not only are you you're not the I chosen, <laughs> there's only one human race, and it's us. Right. You're yeah. a sidebar to the human race. I saw, I saw a, uh, an announcement from, um, what's this guy's name? Billy Graham's son, mm -hmm. whatever his name right. is. Right. Next Tuesday, they're having a day of prayer for the president of the United States mm -hmm. against all the people who have been attacking him. All right? Now, when Barack Obama was president, these white evangelicals were talking about him. Oh, he's a Muslim. He's this, right. he's that. Yes. But they will run up behind this demagogue and talk about God in conjunction with him and that God should bless him. God is in the business of blessing everybody, but everybody is not in the business of honoring the one who gave them the blessing. This man is a demagogue. There's no doubt about it. Right. He's and these, proud of these it. phony religious leaders that are out there, they want the photo op. They want to say they've been to the White House. They've been with. There is no reason for me in my right mind to want to be in the presence of this man. Well, you know, to preserve you know. the country means our overall well-being will be good. But there is a problem with the leadership. Mm -hmm. And the fish stinketh from the head. And everybody has bought in, everybody, you know, most of the people in the political arena have bought into his nonsense. And no man can say he's good if he sits back and does, no does nothing while evil is present Amen. all around him. Well, um, Donald Trump is, is here for a while more. So there's no way of getting him out of office. We have to vote him out. But let's not get but a paralysis know, uh, of analysis. Let me he was produced this. by a system. Mm -hmm. right. He has sustained that system. He's taken it in his own direction. And so... Even if he wasn't there, we still would have to deal with the system. Of course. And then while we deal with it, as we with have from, as, from, with from, from dehumanization and slavery that we went through, we've dealt with the system. And then now we have to say, wait a minute. Is this all we're aiming for? Or do we want a system that really is a mm. system of respecting people, respecting, cool. having a right. God's consciousness, of taking care of, of the young people? Not having the super rich uh, dominate the wealth, talking about a democracy when you got an oligarchy, mm -hmm. uh, U.S. oligarchy that wants to parallel the oligarchies in the Arab world, mm -hmm. in the Russian world, mm -hmm. and in the Asian world. Amen. How can somebody say that my, I got a love affair <laughs> with a monster in Asia who's killing his people and, and say it proudly and say it over and over again? So it's we, amazing how many people go along with it. You see, that's what because you really their minds have strong. been messed up. And I'm saying, if you want to blame black folk, blame the miseducation, blame the lack of of, of effective. Color. If you're trained and taught to hate yourself, what positive is going to come of it? Unless you have your who were they taught? Who we're, taught we're, them that? I had the history books. There's nothing in the history books about black people. Well, we know better. Yeah, but we know better. But we still don't have it in the culture deep in the culture. We don't have it Africanizing our in lives. In the 50s, in the 50s, 50s, we were coming up and we saw Cleopatra. We knew Elizabeth Taylor didn't look anything like Cleopatra. It wasn't in the history book. We had a sense of righteousness that we knew we were special. In the 50s, when you had no information out there, except for Dr. Clark, 
No, and you, uh, a few, no, you, you have, few no, guys that, knew Dr. about Dr. Clark that. had his elders who, who taught him, but... Right? Uh, okay. Let's, no, let's look at it this way. My mother comes up from Virginia. She doesn't come up empty-handed, empty-headed, empty-hearted. Mm -hmm. She knew that Booker T. Washington was struggling for black folk in the South, and he said, put your buckets down where you are, take yeah. care of your own business, grow your own food, That's it. Uh, uh, raise your own cattle, build your own buildings. Right. So Booker T. Washington was a part of her consciousness. They were farmers in Virginia. They knew what it was to take care of business on the land. That's it. They were forced to do it. However, as urbanization took place, then you had some people looking at the urbanization. So part of her growing up was W.E.B. Du Bois, not the W.E.B. Du Bois in the 20s in a conflict with, with Garvey, but W.E.B. Du Bois when he wrote The Philadelphia Negro, the migration of black folks out of the South into, when he wrote his Ph.D. dissertation, which was the suppression of the slave trade system. Mm -hmm. So W.E.B. Du Bois was a part of her world because her great aunt Pocahontas was one of his secretaries. So our problem was, Booker T and W.E.B. And in the 20s, there was the Marcus Garvey movement. That she was a Garveyite. Her father was a Garveyite. She was an, he was a Mason. She was an Eastern star. So when you're into that type of tradition, you go to the East. That's the Nile Valley. So yes, it wasn't a movie Cleopatra that they were aware. It was the reality of being in these societies. My grandfather was murdered by the Klan uh, on July 14th. 1917, when I finally did meet his spirit in that cemetery in 1976 when I was with Alex Haley in Georgia, and there his spirit was. It was his tombstone up to my chest. It was a Tekken. It was a symbol from the Nile Valley, and it said, Jesse Jeffries, born August the 10th, August the 10th, 1868, you know what and died doing, July the 14th. And the twin pillars of masonry were on his tombstone. This is a man who, with one foot out of slavery, became the leader of the community, had their land, the, the schoolhouse that they built. I'm saying that you can't make the sharp distinctions that you want to make. We have been struggling against this system, but, and we but still have to struggle and prepare. Yourself. Put yes. yourself 100 years in front of that. Yes. Doc. What we're dealing with today, with the kids that are doing what? Without fathers. With crack mothers, but that you know, was intended. the genocide. Of that's, course, we know it was the the that was a result so we of the eighties. We're we, talking about the eighties and 80s, crack, we had which a was the worst system. disease that was ever perpetrated on the black people. We had a, a welfare system. Remember that uh, James L. Jones did a movie, Julia yeah, or whatever right. it was. He was he was the garbage man dating the mm -hmm. young lady. She had a son. You can't have a man in the house if you're getting a check. That's right. Everything to dis disrupt the family. Your folks had land. A lot of black people had land. I have friends, they own four or five hundred acres of land, which is a small amount of land, acreage. Right. But I met with black farmers years ago. and They could not get farm subsidies. The federal right. government systematically would not subsidize the black farmers right. with right. the farm, uh, the, the farm subsidy, subsidy program. program. But uh, Monsanto, Carter and all the big, big multi-billion dollar corporations, they were getting mm -hmm. funded by the federal government. Right. So they were purposely doing that to the point where black farmers were losing a thousand acres of land right. a year. I mean a million acres of land a year yeah. in this country. And that was during Bill, Qu Bill Clinton's period. So you've got, like you said, you've got to look at the whole thing, top right. to bottom, left, right, because each one of these government offices is attacking black and That's poor right. people left and right. Mm. And, and our folks mm. can't get out from under that when they're manipulated mentally. This guy Zuckerberg with his Facebook, mm. all the media, all the stuff that's out here, not even the Board of Ed is about educating children anymore. Well, we have to turn that around. And my whole point of talking about this is to, to give some hope to the people that are out there now struggling and raising their kids. You take self-esteem of just being human and loving God and, and staying tuned to your spirit. Spiritual energy is what, what you survive from. Doc takes pride in what he's, he was raised on. 
But there are a lot of people that lack that self-esteem and, and, and fall into the prey of victim. Right. But or not understanding the system. Let's or put it Donald in its context. Not, even if you have a prison system that has two to three million black people mm. in it, you have 50 million black people in America. So let's balance it out. The prison system, as Hakima said in one of his national presentations, at one point, a few years ago, you had 300,000 people in the prison system. And all of a sudden, here you have this enormous ballooning of the prison by design. Mm -hmm. Of course. And so we need to understand that. But we can't, you can't blame the victims. You have to understand what the victims well, you, are calling. So you we have, have to understand that we'll have have, the we'll new have slavery have, is mental. We'll it's a, a mental a, slavery going on now. Okay. And a lot of this That's mental a slavery is, right. is caused by this. And I'm trying to get our but, people out of the mental slavery of loving goodies and shiny so, objects and, and, will you talk, and, will you talk and to gold your, on your neck. Will you talk to your better half and let her know that this is part one of our... Well, you were late. You're 20, I'm, I'm always late. Minutes. That's, I, that's I know, me. But, that ain't nothing don't new. you have to be on time that, today? That ain't nothing new. You'll be docked. But <laughs> we want we, a part two we're going to deal with how we have dealt Only if with you the bring, crises. Your better half on. Well, she was the reason why All I, right. I was. All right. Now, was we know about today. my better half. I want your better half yeah, to come. No, on. that's. That, we'll work it out. All right. Her birthday's coming up in June, so she oh, might. Man. You know. Please. And, and we're supposed to open up the reparations conference oh, that's in Detroit, uh, June the 21st, 22nd, 23rd. We'll be in Detroit uh, opening up the. Uh, and Cobra, right. the National Rosalind, Reparations Conference. Rosalind, uh, Rosalind, you heard that. He promised that you could come on. <laughs> Right? <laughs> now, I've been asking you to come on for years now. Now, Doc said you're going to come. You've had it on. You've had some. Oh, had videos. Videos. Those are, You've had some. That was, footage, a show, right? that was to show you how she affects you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a clip of his wife but way back in. And you know, she was a Sunday school teacher. Oh, she's got a story to really tell. She, well, she's writing it up now. She's oh, actually, that's beautiful. She's There's a strong black woman. But I think the, the issue is that, uh, uh, again, you watch this this year. Um, the strong black woman is going to take down Donald Trump, starting with Tish James. Now, you watch. Pay attention. Now, you see where we come from, where black so, men come from. So we're, it's a black the, woman. The, 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 the uh, women are going to make their contributions. <laughs> what are you going to do with us men? Put us in the closet? Well, we, no, you, you we got to come out of the closet and You're be gonna men. You're going to go save Africa, and we're going to stay here and save no, America. I'm, <laughs> I have a connection. Power to the people. A pan-African connection. God in me real. loves the God in you. Okay. Well, we got another man for the Bronx. The Bronx is still running. We got no, another man. Oh, yeah. well, remember Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass said it best. If mm -hmm. there is no struggle, there is no progress. Right. Those who profess to favor freedom yet deprecate agitation are men who want the crops without plowing up the ground. They want the rain without the thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of as many waters. The struggle may be a moral one. It may be a political one. But it must be a struggle. Why? Because power concedes nothing, nothing without, without a demand. A it right. never did. It never will. So we got to get our demands together and move with power. And Stay we're on strong, a black people. Band. And, and yes. remember, the God in me loves the God in you. And get rid of that slave mentality, and then you set yourself free. There's nothing it. you can't do. Never mind what color you are. There's nothing you can't do, and that goes for white people, too. You can love everybody, even Donald Trump. Well, it's going to save his butt. Power to the people. God bless. Wakanda forever. <laughs> <laughs> Wakanda forever. <laughs> Black power and the African cow. We are rising. We got too many settlers and not enough pioneers. Yeah. Everybody oh. wants to show up, want you to do the it's work. It's always a war amongst us, man, that I'm mainly concerned.